Nation, I am so pleased to let you know that the Rising Tide Mastermind is a success. We have completely filled two groups since we started the Rising Tide Mastermind in early January. Now, you might be wondering what a mastermind is. And simply put, a mastermind is where people get together to try to make each other more successful. We encourage each other to get better and to keep the commitments needed to help each other get there. So if this sounds like something that you need, I urge you to find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind. You can do that by going to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to see if this group is right for you. Welcome to Scaling Up, the podcast where we're scaling up on knowledge so we don't scale up our systems. Hello, Scaling Up Nation. Trace Blackmore here, your host for Scaling Up H2O. And Nation, what is going on? We just had the new year and now one month is down. We are one twelfth down for the year and we ended last year and started this new year with taking account with what we did the previous year and what our goals are going to be this next year. Well, I hope you did that and you are now one month down on achieving those goals. And I heard from several people when I did those episodes that they were very thankful that I did that type of episode because so many of us know that we need to improve each and every year but we don't know how to do that. So setting up some SMART goals like we talked about during the last episode of the year and the first episode of the year, now people know how to plan with that. The issue I think we have is people don't know how to execute. Well, since we're one month down, if you have not started, you now have 11 months to get those goals started. So one of the books that I recommended on those episodes that I just mentioned was the 12-week year. Now, on those episodes, I mistakenly called it the 13-week year, and that's because that's how I actually use the planning method. If you multiply 13 times 4, you actually get 52, and that's what makes sense to me. But it's called the 12-week year, and that's a book that is by Brian Moran, and he uh, did a great job of helping all of us figure out how we're going to execute in a 12-week period and to put metrics on that so we know if we're on track or off track. So if you haven't gotten a copy of that book, I think it's a great book to read. It is on Audible. You can go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash 12-week year. And since I misspoke, it's also on there forward slash 13-week year. And you can get that book. So before I announce our guest, I want to talk about a few things that are going on in the water treatment community. The first one is actually happening this very week, and as this episode airs, I am in Tampa, Florida, and I am at the business owners meeting that the Association of Water Technologies is putting on. So if you're wondering what is going on here at the business owners meeting, the AWT has put on certain topics to help business owners become more successful. The other thing that's happening here is a lot of networking. Folks, you know it is lonely in the water treatment industry. Well, let me tell you, it is even more lonely when you own a water treatment business. So owners getting together to talk to each other definitely helps us find out ways to solve things because now we've got more friends to do so. And that's really what the benefit of the Association of Water Technologies has been to me. I've been able to find lifelong friendships within the association because we have a commonality. We do the exact same thing. And it is so cool when you can talk about certain issues that you are having to somebody that understands because they're having those same issues. So just so many reasons to join associations. Another event that is coming up very quickly is the AWT's technical training. Now, we do that twice a year. 
We're getting ready to do it just at the end of this month, February 26th through 29th in Seattle, Washington, and then again in Cleveland, March 18th through 21st. Now, this is my favorite time of year because I love being part of the people that put on this training. It's a great honor to be able to work with all these great water treatment Jedi, and I get to meet so many people from this training, and it's people like you that listen to this show, and you let me know that you really enjoy the show, things you might not like about the show, things you want me to change, things you want me to add, people you want me to interview, topics you want me to talk about. So it's just my favorite time of year. Now, if you're wondering what goes on during this technical training, we actually have three different classes going on simultaneously. So the first one is the Fundamentals and Applications class. And what that is, that's for individuals that have been in the industry for about three years or less, or people that train those individuals, or people that are in water treatment and have never attended the Fundamentals and Applications class. Now, I know that sounds weird, but here's what we've done as trainers. There's only so much time that we have with everybody in the audience. So we had to say, we're going to teach up to a certain point in fundamentals and applications, and then we're going to start the technical training. So if you have not been to a technical training in a long time, I actually advise that you do take the fundamentals and applications class and then come the next session, take the technical training class. And Reed Hutchinson, just came on a couple of weeks ago. He said he did this and he got so much more out of the technical training. So let me tell you about the technical training. So the core class that we have, so that's three years plus. This is for people that have been in the industry and they're getting ready to take their CWT examination. Now keep in mind, It does not teach the examination, but it does bring you up to a common level where people that would be of the stature to take the CWT examination should be. And then there's also a wastewater class that's going on with that. And if you come in a day early, you can do a sales training class or you can do a reverse osmosis class. There's just so much going on here. So if you have not signed up for this. I hope that you are rethinking that because you hear how amazing it is. You can go to the Association of Water Technologies website at awt.org, find out more information, and sign up there. Now, if you do come, please let me know that you listen to this show and let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to hear, and I will definitely try to oblige you with that. Now, since we're on the topic of the Association of Water Technologies, the convention, the annual convention and expo is going to be September 30th through October 3rd in Louisville, Kentucky. So lots of great things there. Of course, I'll be there. Many of you will be there. I always get so many show ideas during the convention time. So it's early in the year. Mark your calendars for these events. And while you have your calendars out, you might want to consider marking down November 8th and 12th. Now that's the International Water Conference and that is another group like the AWT, but it serves a more larger industry. Now that's going to be in San Antonio, Texas this year. They go through a rotating model, so every year they rotate to another city of three cities, and this year they're going to be in San Antonio, Texas. Now, I will be interviewing two of the key individuals of the International Water Conference on next week's show. I know I talk a lot about the Association of Water Technologies, but there's so many associations out there that deal with the same type of industries that we of the Scaling Up Nation are dealing with, I want to make sure I'm bringing those resources to you. So I'll be talking to Jim Summerfield and Jay Harwood. Now, Jim is the general chair and Jay is the technical chair. So these guys are pretty high up in the organization. And I just sat down with them and I asked them all the questions I had and I thought you would have about the International Water Conference so you can learn about other organizations. So that's going to be next week. And speaking of the IWC, they are now accepting abstracts for papers. 
Now, if you've never presented at IWC, it is a lot different from most places. Now, we're going to talk about what that is next week. But if you go to my show notes page, you can see there'll be a link there that will take you directly to their call for papers. And the deadline for that is March 6th. So if you're thinking about speaking at the IWC, you definitely want to get that in before March 6th. I've been getting a lot of calls about the Rising Tide Mastermind. Of course, you've heard I've been doing ads in the front and the back of each and every show. I am so excited that the Rising Tide Mastermind is a success. We have filled up two groups. So two groups have been filled up and we are now starting the waiting list for the next group. So if you think the Rising Tide Mastermind is something that is right for you, or you at least want to learn more, go to scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind to find out more, to see if this is right for you. And one of the things we're doing in the mastermind is we are reading the very book that I talked about during the top of the show, the 12 week year. But what we're doing there is we're taking a deep dive within that book, figuring out how to use it with our day to day to actually get things done and make traction on the goals that we've set for each other. The other thing we're doing is we're holding each other accountable for those goals. So each and every week, people know that we are going to be expecting each other to make traction, to make headway on what they said that they were going to do. As Tim mentioned in the Mastermind show we did last year, Some people might listen to that and think that sounds awful. However, it might be the very nudge you need to become more successful. So once again, that's scalinguph2o.com forward slash mastermind. And before I introduce my guest, I want to mention one more thing. On episodes 120 and 121, now those were the episodes with Dr. Janet Stout of Special Pathogens Laboratory. And we talked about all things Legionella. We talked about ASHRAE's 188. We talked about the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Memorandum. And that has sparked so many questions within the Scaling Up Nation. So Nation, here is my ask for you. I think a Scaling Up Pinks and Blues episode is in order to answer all these questions but I want to get some more questions. So for those of you that have already called in and asked me questions specific to Legionella, thank you so much. If you have not done that and you have a question, please let me know what that is. You've got two ways to do that. You go to scalinguph2o.com and you can look for the pop-up button on the right side of the screen, click on that and leave me a voicemail. I may go ahead and play your voice on the show if you do that, or you can just go to the show ideas page and just type me a message there. Either way, I need your questions because I want to use the water treater's perspective and make sure that the people that are interfacing directly with the customers, the people that are responsible for these plans, you know exactly what you need to know. And I know you have questions, so let me know what they are. I will get answers to those questions so you have the knowledge you need to talk to your customers so we can lead them down the correct path of reducing legionellosis in our communities. Nation, our guest today is Justin Ranger, CWT, and I met Justin at the Association of Water Technologies. We worked on several training projects together. We became friends because of working on those projects, plus we saw each other at technical trainings and different events, and he's also a member of the Rising Tide Mastermind. And if you've ever met Justin, you know that he dons the best mustache in all all of water treatment. He's got a handlebar mustache and I couldn't do something like that. I definitely couldn't pull that look off, but he does. And he has come on today's show to share all about being a water treater. We all get in this industry a different way and we all experience this industry in a different way. And I truly believe that we can learn from each other's experiences. So please help me welcome Justin Ranger, CWT. My lab partner today is certified water technologist, Justin Ranger of CH2O. How are you today, sir? 
I'm doing great, Trace. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. And if I might say, I think you have the best mustache and water treatment. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I'm sure there's some other good ones out there, but uh, yeah, I enjoy having it. So, uh, and for all those out there in the Scaling Up Nation, you're going to have to go to the show notes page so you can cast your vote on that as well. <laughs> That's good. So uh, let's introduce yourself to the Scaling Up audience so they know who they're talking to. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Well, as you point out, I uh, live in Boise, Idaho. Married for going on 10 years now, which is just absolutely astonishing how quickly that goes by. Yeah. My wife has low standards too. So it's, it's, it's great we can find women like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. She's, my wife's very patient. Uh, she's a great woman. Yeah, we've got two kids. They're seven and five, a uh, son and daughter, which they're just an absolute blast, always exploring and discovering the world. We bought a house a few years back that we've been renovating, and um, uh, Boise is just a fantastic place to live. There's been a, a lot of people moving here, so the joke lately has been to tell everybody that the town has a terrible stench and lava flows through the streets and <laughs> keep everybody away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So obviously there was some point in your life where you said something was missing. I've got to get into water treatment. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I think it's pretty interesting. I, you know, I didn't realize I, I'm not related to anybody in the water treatment industry. So listening to the podcast, hearing all the stories of people that had fathers that were in the industry or something of that nature is kind of fascinating to me. I suppose I'm in the other camp. I kind of fell into it by accident. I didn't know that it was a thing that existed. I was in college and I was studying chemistry and material science engineering. And I had a friend who worked for a local company. That company had a, a separate division that did kind of preventative maintenance for HVAC systems. So changing filters, cleaning coils and changing belts, that kind of thing. So they were looking for a college kid to work at night and uh, change belts and filters. And I had some mechanical aptitude and was a responsible individual. So I said, you'd be a great fit. Yeah. And then after the owner found out I had some experience with chemistry, um, he kind of added me onto the water treatment side and I started doing just basic service tech work, you know, going out and pulling samples and running tests on equipment. And from there, it's just kind of grown into a career. It's been 11 years now that I've been doing it. Now, what was the thing that happened that just made you say, yeah, this is something I can do. I want to do this. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. For a long time, I was in just that service tech position with a local company, and it, it was a great company. The owner was a, a really great guy, had a great heart, but I really just never thought of it anything more than a job, you know, just kind of clock in, clock out, not think about it anymore after work. Yeah, and then he ended up deciding he wanted to do something different, and so uh, he ended up selling to CH2O, and I kind of went along with that business transaction and it was at that point that my mind was really opened up at how expansive and diverse the water treatment field and industry is and how much knowledge there is available. And it was really at that point that I decided to make it a career to go after getting my CWT and become the best water treater that I'm able to be. I love it. I love it. So you mentioned the magic word CWT. You know, you're a listener to the show. I'm a huge proponent of people getting their certified water technologist. You have yours congratulations, but I'm going to help the Scaling Up Nation through you because I want them to know the process that you went through. One, to say, you know what, I really need to go after this certification. And then two, what you did because you were successful in getting it. Yeah. So I, th I think it's a great thing to do. Obviously, as other people on the show have said, it, it does distinguish you in the industry. I think it's good for your self-confidence. You know, it does reaffirm that you do know what you do know. Uh, I think one of the dangers of being new or a novice in any field is that you don't necessarily know the limits of your knowledge. So you may think that you know more than you actually do, but just the rigors of studying for the exam, and it exposes you to so many different aspects of water treatment, like wastewater and potable water and some of the more niche fields besides just boilers, loops, and towers that I think that it gives you a real sense of where you sit within the industry. So that, that way you can be confident when you do answer a question for a customer that, yeah, this, this is in line with industry standards and best practices. I'm not just making it up or it's not just my opinion on the matter. And then when you do run into something that 
that maybe you're less familiar with, you have a point of reference to say, well, you know, I, I know that I'm not an expert on that, but I know where resources are, or I know some individuals that I can talk to, to find the correct answer. And I think that, that that's a great thing. Was there a significant event where you said, you know what, I need to go get my CWT? No, I don't, I don't think there was any specific thing that happened. Our company culture, you know, Tony McNamara has been, he's our president. He's been involved with the AWT in the past. And um, I don't know what his current involvement is. He's a pretty busy guy. But uh, he's a big proponent of continuing education and having guys study for and take the CWT exam. So I think that when I came to work for the company, there was kind of an initial challenge, you know, that I should take the time and effort to study up and take the exam. So I think that was probably the, the thing that kind of directed me towards it. Now, have you noticed any difference with how people relate to you, either in uh, other water treatment companies or how customers relate to you because you do have those initials after your name? Yeah, well, I think, again, I take myself more seriously than I did, you know, in the first year or two that I was doing the job, more res personal responsibility. And so I think with that, when you really take the time to find the correct answers to, to problems, just the other week, I went into a construction trailer for a, a large new construction project, and the head engineer was, you know, the only guy working during the lunch hour when I walked in. And uh, so I handed him my card, and we were exchanging some information to get so I could get looped in on that project. And uh, so he grabbed my card, and he goes, certified water, I was like, a technologist. So I think that, you know, just having that designation after your name when you're working with other professionals shows, again, your commitment to the industry, your dedication to wanting to learn, and that you've really put in the time and effort to do those things. And so, so yeah, I, I do think that customers probably respect me and listen to me a little bit more. And, and I don't mean that as like a, an ego stroke or anything like that, but they just know that if I'm going to make a recommendation for their system, that it, it is going to be in line with best practices and industry standards. It's going to keep their systems running efficiently and provide the best long-term results for operations and those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I wanted to ask you, here in Georgia, we're seeing more and more specifications where people are saying, if you're going to work on my system, you or somebody very close to this project has to have that certified water technologist designation. Are you seeing that as well? You know, I'm not. But, you know, I think that that's one of the competitive advantages in your market. So I've begun to circulate some of that material that the AWT provides for the benefits of hiring a CWT to some of the mechanical contractors and building owners and engineers in town to just say, hey, look, if you really want to ensure that you're going to have a qualified company in town working on your, your systems, this could be a good standard to incorporate into your requirements. I wouldn't doubt if you start seeing that sometime in the near future. I know more and more marketplaces are starting to adopt language like that, especially with uh, ASHRAE 188 and how New York has adopted that. I think it's just a matter of time when customers and people that own the equipment that we are working on are just going to say, okay, well, we need some sort of peace of mind to know that the person we've hired has some sort of other vetting process. And it seems like the world has accepted CWT for that vetting process. Yeah, and I, I think that's great. You know, I get asked a lot, oh, did you did you go to college for water treatment? And it's like, well, no, there's no quote unquote water treatment college degree to get. Um, you know, I studied fields that were related and relevant. But yeah, I think that as, you know, I guess what I've realized, and this is my perception anyway, is that the industry is relatively new in terms of, you know, the last 150 years or so. And so I think that people are going to want to see more of those professional credentials when they're selecting or hiring water treaters or water treatment companies. I did want to ask you about your material science degree. I have a material science engineer that works with me, and he has books that just explain how corrosion takes place. And where we in the water treatment industry, you know, talk about maybe a quarter of a chapter of what's in those books. He just has this incredible understanding because that's what he went to school for. And because of that, he's done very well as a water treatment professional. Do you find the same thing with you? Yeah, well, and I'll, I'll clarify too. I didn't actually finish college with a material science degree. 
I changed my major a few times. So I started with chemistry and math, and then I changed schools and the chemistry credits didn't transfer. So then I was just math for a while. And then I was math and material science engineering. And so I took three or four courses, I believe it was, in that field. And yeah, I think it's incredibly helpful understanding the way materials work, understanding manufacturing processes. That's one of the things that I see as a common problem in the industry is just material selection or material compatibility, either with feeding concentrated chemical products like what we do, or just the way that systems are designed. If they would have selected a different material, they wouldn't have to worry about corrosion rates or the corrosion rates would be much lower than, you know, just picking carbon steel or something of that nature, you know. So yeah, I think it's a great background to enter into the water treatment industry with a material science degree. And one of the things that I've considered is going back and getting a master's in that field. I ended up graduating just with a philosophy degree because I'd changed my major a couple of times. It was going to take six years to finish the undergrad material science degree. And so when I spoke to the chair, she said, you know what? Instead of doing six years to end up with a bachelor's, why don't you just finish your bachelor's in math, come back and do the master's program, so you'll have the same amount of schooling, you'll be an advanced degree. But honestly, by the time I graduated college, I was pretty burnt out on school and ready to get married. And <laughs> yeah, so that was the plan. I, I got my bachelor's degree and said, you know, I think that's just good enough for now. Well, you're a fellow water treater, and I know we all do similar things, but describe your day-to-day -day for the Scaling Up Nation, if you don't mind. Yeah, so the role that I have is a dual role of sales and service. So in my territory, I'm, I'm responsible for both. And I really enjoy that. I enjoy both aspects of the industry in terms of going out and winning new business and working with clients and uh, customer facing, being on the project development side of projects and that kind of thing, or project planning side, I should say. And then the other side is the, the more technical side, the actual service where you're going out into the field and performing the water analysis and inspecting equipment and looking over problems or issues that may be arising or weird problems that customers bring to you. You know, once they find out, you know, a little bit, they think that you can solve every, every problem that might be water related. Yeah. And so that includes, you know, sometimes installing chemical pumps or going out and rebuilding them or calibrating controllers and that kind of stuff as well. So it's a uh, pretty all encompassing role for me. Well, you mentioned weird stuff that customers bring to you. I'm curious, what's the weirdest? Oh, I don't know. It's, um, I was in a food processing plant one time and they were having some corrosion to some stainless steel. And so they wanted me to come in and look at the corrosion. And it, it really wasn't a water treatment related product because water didn't interact with those surfaces. It turned out that it was the cleaning company was using an incompatible product with stainless steel. And uh, that's what was causing the corrosion. So it was an interesting thing to, to take some time and go look at their equipment and do a little bit of research and get back to them. But yeah, I'd, I guess I'd, I'd consider that one of those odd things that comes up from time to time. Yeah, I can't remember. Have I told the don't hurt my baby story on, on the show? I know I've told it at AWT millions of times. I, I certainly don't recall that story. I'd love to hear it. One of my favorite weird stories, and we as water treaters just see some weird stuff out there. And this was when I was relatively new into the water treatment industry, and I was still working with my dad. We had picked up a school system, and we were going around to survey. And I was with one of the engineers that was assigned to the water treatment there. That was back when they actually had people that would do stuff like that. And uh, he got a call where he had to drop me off at one school and go to, uh, service a call at another one. And he put me with the janitor. And the janitor was not happy to see me at all. I don't know what was going on. And uh, we kind of entered uh, in the back of the school where the playground was and went to go see the mechanical room. And when I was introducing myself to the janitor, I introduced myself and he said, so you're the chemical guy? And I was like, yeah, that's, that, that's one of the things they call us. And he said, well, don't you hurt my babies? And I didn't really know what to do with that. And I just ignored it. So we were, we were looking at everything and I was taking notes and figuring out what type of equipment they had there, what we were going to have to bring in. And then I asked to go see the cooling tower, which was on the roof. And it was one of those ladder deals that you've got to climb up and then open the hatch on the, on the roof. So he went ahead of me and opened the hatch and he was on the roof and I came out 
And uh, the cooling tower was behind some baffles so it would look nice around the area and keep some stuff out of it. And uh, I asked him, I said, you know, it's the, the cooling tower I assume is over here and we're walking to it. And uh, kind of gave me a real short reply, yeah. And uh, I was asking questions about the cooling tower. And he said again, I don't want you to hurt my babies. And I was like, sir, that's the second time you've said that to me. Do you, are you worried I'm going to spray like bleach or something on the playground or on the kids? What, what are you saying when you say that? Right then he opens the cooling tower door and he goes, no, my babies. And they're about 19 inch koi fish swimming around in the basin of that cooling tower. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, sir, your baby's got to go. And uh, we were not friends from that day. Yeah, that's amazing. I've seen trees and cattails and things like that growing in cooling towers, but never fish. <laughs> they were doing very well. And uh, that was probably a testament to why we got the business from the previous vendor. Right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't remember if I told that on uh, on the air or not, but there, there you go. And that's one of my favorite ones. So if you come to a class that I teach, you got to you got to listen through that again, because that's one of the one of the ones that I tell. You and I were speaking earlier and you're, you go out and you see something and you say, you know, maybe the water treaters shouldn't be doing that. Or maybe the water treaters should think a little bit more about safety before they do that. So with that, I thought you could talk a little bit about some of the things that you've seen and then how the water treater really should be thinking about safety a little more often. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a great topic. Yeah, so where, where I live, the state of Idaho used to have a boiler inspection and training program, which as I understand a lot of other states have. I know that uh, my colleagues in Oregon and Washington, they have something similar to that there. But in Idaho, the legislature made that program defunct about 10 years ago. They did away with it. And so what that's kind of resulted in is a lot of customers, you know, it's been about 10 years now that don't really have any background or training in operating, you know, boilers specifically, but cooling towers as well. And um, so it's just kind of resulted in some kind of bizarre and weird situations developing. You know, the customers rely on the vendors a lot for training. You know, obviously, whenever I go into an account, I try to be real thorough on, you know, the water treatment program, how it works, how to control it, testing and parameters that they should be looking for and that kind of thing. But yeah, the, the customers rely heavily on the vendors. And so I've just seen some weird things over my years where, you know, I've seen someone who owns a boiler weld on the pressure vessel itself, like, oh, that nipple's leaking on the side of the boiler. Uh, we'll just weld it to the shell so it stops leaking. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, uh, I've seen pressure relief valves with plugs in them because they were leaking by instead of just replacing them or having some schedule to replace them. So those things, you know, those are really serious and dangerous circumstances. So I think with regard to safety, it's good to know what those standards are as the water treatment professional so that if you ever walk into a boiler room and you see a pressure relief valve with a plug in it, you know, you can sound the alarm as it were, you know, go get the appropriate plant personnel to say, look, this is not right. This is dangerous as the potential to, to really endanger people's life and limb. So I think that that's good. The, the other thing that I've seen over the years is just, um, and I know Jay Farmery talks about this in his section on liability during the technical training. Yeah, Jay Farmer is definitely the godfather of water treatment safety for the community. Yeah, so it, it obviously I'm no expert like he is. He would be fantastic to get on the show and go over those things in more detail. But I remember him telling some stories and I've seen some similar things where contractors are trying to, you know, quote unquote, do the customer a favor by maybe installing the boiler skimmer blowdown piping or you know, I've had customers ask me to install DA tanks for them. It's like, no, no, I, I don't do that. <laughs> um, well, you know, or you're on the phone troubleshooting, you know, some problem and they're like, well, while you're there, why don't you just lean over and pull that fuse out of that panel for me? I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not going to do that either. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So I guess with that is, you know, knowing the limitations and liabilities of what your company as a water treatment company does, the risks and liabilities they're willing to take on. You know, for us, we don't do mechanical work. We're not going to pipe a bl skimmer blowdown or change fuses in a compressor panel or anything like that. And then just being aware of the general safety guidelines, OSHA recommendations with regard to, you know, the personal protective equipment, glasses and gloves, hearing protection, 
you know, if you're doing a boiler inspection that requires being on top of the boiler, you probably should have some fall protection. Um, obviously, confined space entry is a topic that's deeper than what we can go into now, but you shouldn't be getting into confined spaces without the appropriate program and safety equipment and personnel in place to do that in a safe and controlled manner. So yeah, those are some of the things I kind of had in mind with that. Yeah, so nobody ever plans to get hurt, and you've done something a hundred times, and it's that hundred and first time where something happens. I'm going to call Mark Lewis out for a second. Uh, he was inspecting a boiler that was opened up, and he had been on top of this boiler dozens of times. Well, it just so happened that this was the time that the ladder slipped and he fell off, and luckily he didn't get hurt, but they had to report that as, a, as an incident. And then uh, they ended up putting some safety equipment there where he didn't need a ladder anymore the next time he inspected it. They now had a catwalk up there and a, and a fixed ladder. So, um, you know, you, you never know when those things are going to happen. And in that story, he was doing everything right. He had a, somebody holding the ladder for him and he wasn't really overreaching. For some reason, the ladder just gave way and he went down. That's the thing. I, re I remember one of an incident, you know, it's kind of embarrassing now, but Early on in my career, I just, you know, could have received some more training and just didn't know. I was at a customer's facility, small boiler, and um, needed to replace a stainless steel check valve that injected the chemical into the boiler feed line. And so I just went over and turned the feed pump and to the off position and went over to the boiler and closed the isolation valve and started to unscrew the check valve. And I, I forget, I walked away from it for a second. Uh, the valve wasn't all the way unscrewed. But in the meantime, one of the plant operators had walked in the door and walked around and saw that the feed pump handoff auto switch was in the off position and said, oh, that should be an auto and flipped it on. And, you know, hot DA water started spraying out of the loose pipe fitting. And fortunately, nobody got hurt and nothing was damaged. But that's just a situation that that really opened my eyes like, wow, there's real potential for people to to be injured. And, you know, obviously in that situation, the plant personnel should have been notified to the work that was going on and the equipment should have been locked out and tagged out properly. So from that incident, is that now something that you do is use uh, lockout tag out? Yeah, so that's that's right, is always working with the operators and then following lockout tag out procedures. You know, the, the whole idea behind that is removing the potential energy from a system so that way you're not injured, especially when you're in a plant where there's multiple people working out uh, or working in that area. And Justin, I got to say, I'm really surprised at the number of water treaters that don't carry lockout tags and the hasp with them so they can actually lock out a power source. I was with somebody and they were working on a controller and the controller was actually energized in the other room. And the only way that you could disconnect it was to, you know, flip the, the breaker that it was on. And they flipped the breaker and their hands were inside this controller. And they uh, were hoping nobody would flip that breaker back. And that's a, that's a little bit too much faith that I want to have. It'd be very easy just to, you know, go ahead and isolate that to notify people with that lockout tagout system that, hey, something's going on, and if you flip this, if there's a potential that you might hurt somebody. So those things are cheap. Carry those with you. And, and another thing, and I think we were talking about this earlier, I'm surprised how many people don't realize that uh, they have to conform to the plan of that customer when they're on their site. So if you and I work for the same company and we had our training within our water treatment company, that doesn't count. We also have to be trained on that specific site. And a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. Well, and there's a big difference between customers. You know, you might be working at a small schoolhouse where their training program is probably pretty minimal. Uh, they may not have a formal lockout tagout program, even though they should. All the way up, you know, to heavy industry, where they're going to have really strict safety protocol, probably exceed the OSHA standards, and they're going to have a written plan that you can join in and get trained on and be a part of. And and so I think it's good for us to just be educated on all those things, to know when the responsibility falls with us, when it falls with the customer, and then we can help be a catalyst. Say, you know, Mr. Customer, if you weren't aware, you should have a written lockout tagout program for this equipment, and we should get all the operators trained on it so that way no one gets hurt. 
And that's a huge resource. And most water treaters aren't going to do that. So if that customer can find one that is, they're probably going to keep them on for a while. Well, I think that's exactly right. I think that's that's the next level besides just being a really good water treater, knowing your trade well and doing uh, the right things in terms of protecting the equipment to being a professional and being a real asset to the customer in every aspect, being the vendor that's on site. And certainly that includes safety. I, I saw a video on LinkedIn the other day. It, um, it was amazing. It was a, a construction site. There's like a two or three story opening on the side of a building with a crane and a forklift. And it was like a, a great all forklift on the ground and then a crane. And then it was just like a normal sized forklift that they were either trying to get into the hole or pulling out of the hole to put it on the ground. And at any rate, they certainly didn't secure it properly. And all the chains broke and the forklift that they were putting into or pulling out of the building ended up falling all the way to the ground. And it was just like, wow, these are these are really serious situations. And we want to make sure that we're not jeopardizing our own lives or anybody else's by anything we're doing when we're on a construction site or customer's location. Yeah. And I think you make a great point. A lot of times the customer doesn't really think what could happen if you do this. They're just thinking, I need it done. You're there. You're willing to do it. And then the water treater will think, well, I'm not thinking about what could happen if I do this. I just want to make the customer happy. And it's something simple that I can do. But I think if we can take a second to step back and ask ourselves, okay, you know, can we potentially get hurt or hurt somebody else or some equipment with this? We might think a little bit more about what we need to do or maybe in the case not do when a customer asks us to do something. Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's exactly right. And I think that that's the right position. You know, if a, if a customer is asking you to do something that's not within OSHA guidelines or against them or something that's just inherently not safe to be able to say, no, let's let's think about this. Maybe there's a better way to go about this rather than just feeling that you have to comply because it was the customer's request. Yeah. And I would also say that if you're listening to this and you can't remember the last time you had a safety conversation within your company, that maybe that's something good that can come from this conversation. You know, go to the people that you're in charge of or the people that are in charge of you and ask them, you know, maybe this is something that we should do and maybe give them some suggestions from what we were just talking about. Yeah, I think that's a, a great idea. I know that, you know, when I first started the industry, I didn't have any safety training, uh, didn't have glasses or even just gloves with me when I would go out to do my service work. And I remember priming a pump one time and, you know, it was kind of leaking around the fittings as I was trying to get the tubing snugged up and that kind of thing. And looking down and my hands were starting to turn orange. I said, oh, that's probably not good. And running to the bathroom, trying to wash it off. And then the next day, just a layer of skin peeling off my hands. And, uh, you know, that was just a really poor situation to be in. You know, I didn't take the time to read the SDS sheets or to know what chemicals I was working with. In hindsight, it was glutaraldehyde. But, you know, I just shouldn't have been in that situation from the company's perspective either. You know, they should have provided some training at that time. So, yeah, I think it's good just for all of us to take that personal responsibility. You know, those SDS sheets are out there and available for our protection, almost all of them say to wear a minimum of safety glasses. You know, when I go to work, I put my glasses on when I get in my truck and I take them off when I pull into my driveway at the end of the day, because some of that damage is irreversible. And at the end of the day, it's, it's your own body that you're um, trying to protect. You know, nobody's going to be able to give you your eyes back if you make a poor decision or you're not informed about the dangers of a situation. You're absolutely right. And again, nobody plans to get hurt and it happens in an instant. I'm always surprised when I see people that just refuse to wear hearing protection. And I've, I've been fairly diligent with that in my career, but my dad wasn't. And he was losing parts of his hearing, especially in the high range, because of all the chiller wine that he was exposed to during his career. So there's just no reason for that. Take a moment, use proper hearing protection, and uh, you'll be able to hear for the rest of your life, which I'm sure everybody wants to do. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's fantastic advice. And it's just easy to do. You know, you had no idea when we started this interview that we were going to be saving lives today, did you? Yeah, well, I, I certainly hope so. Hopefully nobody's in that dangerous of a situation. But um, like you said, nobody plans for it when they uh, leave their house. 
Well, I think this was a great conversation, and I hope that people in the Scaling Up Nation will just take a second and think, how can I make sure that I can keep myself and others safe? And should this be something that I can do? And if I can do it, how can I do it so no one's going to get hurt? So with that said, I'm curious, you're out there, you're servicing day to day, you're running into to different issues day to day. What's the most common issue that you face? What do you see over and over again? And then how do you overcome it? One of the most common things I see, especially going out to get new customers, and this is kind of related, is just really poor operator training. You know, operators that aren't familiar with really how their equipment functions, uh, aren't really that familiar with water treatment or water treatment programs, how they're designed to work, the benefits that they offer. You know, unfortunately, Trace, there's some unscrupulous individuals that are in the industry that may not be as concerned with the customer's well-being as they should be. They may not take that effort to really work with people and to train them, or they might just be concerned with the sales at the end of the day. So I think it's our job to really, as you've said before, raise that bar and set a high standard within the industry and to educate people and make sure that they're well-informed. Yeah, it's been my experience that most water treaters do that, and there are just a few out there that aren't scrupulous, as you put it. But that's the exception and not the rule, or at least that's how I choose to look at that because I, uh, I'm i very fond of our water treatment brothers and sisters out there. So if you are one of those people, please stop ruining our industry. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely right. I think that by and far the, the majority of the companies that are out there and the individuals that are working are working hard and trying to do the right thing. There's just a few individuals and they can give a bad name. I don't know how many times I've, I've walked into a building and been called a snake oil salesman. And then a few months later, you know, great friends with the, the individuals and they have a much better understanding of their water treatment program. That's been the biggest issue for me as well. I've got to overcome somebody's conception of what water treaters are or who water treaters are when I'm out trying to get new business. And I've got to get over that hurdle before they'll even start listening to me. So uh, I hear you, man. Yeah. Well, and, and I found that that sometimes those those older guys that are really cranky, you know, I had a, a, a new client one time that every time I'd go down to do service, he would just curse me upside up one side and down the other and just tell me how terrible of a human being I was for peddling water treatment products. And, you know, over time, I think that he saw that I was actually providing a genuine beneficial service and I wasn't trying to sell him things that he didn't need or anything of that nature. Uh, he ended up becoming a great friend. And what I learned from that was that sometimes those guys that are really standoffish and cranky, uh, maybe they've been burned or had some bad history or something in the past, but they usually know what they want and they're looking for. And so if you're able to provide good products and good services, um, you're able to win them over and have a, a lifelong friend and customer after that. I think it's good to really take the effort to, to do that and not shy away from it. Great advice. There are a lot of new people that listen to this show. They've just gotten into water treatment. Any advice that you can give them as they're trying to learn how to be the best water treater out there? Well, I think the, the AWT is a, a fantastic organization. So really take the time to use the resources that they put out there for education. You know, the technical training seminars are fantastic. The online modules and safe, there's safety training on the AWT website. I guess we could mention that since we were talking about it earlier as well. The Analyst is a fantastic publication. There's lots of really good technical information and case studies and things like that in there. And so I'd really encourage them to read, to you know, watch videos that get put out on YouTube and to just really own their education. Don't wait for somebody else to quote unquote teach you or show you how to do it, but take the initiative to, to go out and find the information for yourself as well and um, to own, own your education and own your career. I got to tell you, I love that. You've got to be responsible for you getting better, for you learning more. And if you're waiting for somebody else to bring that to you, it may never happen. That, that's some of the best advice I think I've ever heard for new people. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really fantastic people in the industry and a lot of great mentors. But you know, I'd venture to say that a, a lot of them have probably risen to the top of the industry because they owned it themselves. They didn't wait to be shown that they, they took that initiative. Again, that is great advice. 
So I always give people the opportunity, the the one thing question. So somebody's just joining into the Scaling Up H2O podcast right now, and they just hear one thing that we're talking about. What do you want that one thing to be? I, I guess I don't want to sound redundant, but I guess it would be that that application, um, that responsibility and initiative. And that's, you know, Trace, as you've asked other people on the podcast, if they would go back in time and and maybe I'm cutting off your question sooner than I should, but... Yeah, I'm actually getting ready to ask that. So uh, don't steal my thunder on that one. Yeah, sorry. But yeah, you know, if you can go back in time and, and tell yourself that uh, at the beginning, one lesson that they should learn, that's, that's what I would have told myself is, you know, don't sit idle just in a job for five years, but to really start learning and growing from the first day that, like I said before, there's so much knowledge um, and information in this industry. There's so many different types of equipment and manufacturers and designs. They should really take the time to learn all the details of the chemistry and the equipment and um, become, you know, the next industry expert. So that's, that's what I'd hope to be by the end of my, a long career. You know, it sounds like you have a lot of fun in your job. Is that safe to say? Oh, I do. I absolutely love it. Maybe I shouldn't admit this on, on the air, but uh, I, I had a day off last week and I was home with my wife and about halfway through the day, I was like, man, I really miss being at work. And it wasn't that I wasn't enjoying my time with my family because we were, we were having a lot of fun. We'd gone to a museum, but uh, I would really missed going out and seeing customers and doing the testing and looking at equipment and all the things that I typically do in a day. I, I really do enjoy it. I think it's a blast. Yeah, make sure your wife doesn't listen to this part of the interview. Yeah, <laughs> just fast forward. But I got to say, that's how this job should be. And that's how I look at this job. I absolutely love being a water treater. I'm proud of it. I've got a podcast about it. If you're out there and you don't have that feeling, it exists. So I hope the Scaling Up Nation would ask themselves, do I have that feeling and how can I get that feeling? And if there's no way for you to get that feeling, make room for somebody that can have that feeling because I can't think of a better job out there. Yeah, I absolutely agree. There's um, so much diversity in the customers we see. I enjoy not sitting at a desk all day. It's nice to have some desk time, but to have some windshield time and go out and see different manufacturers. And yeah, it's uh, there's so much variety in it. I think it's for me the perfect job. Well, you've already entered into our lightning round questions, so uh, you've answered the first one that I asked. So, uh, and that was that was a great answer, by the way. I, I really appreciate you doing that, even though it might have been a little bit early. But no one's keeping score; it's all right. So, uh, but people do want to know what you're reading. So, what are the last few books you've read? Oh man, so I'm I'm always reading multiple books. I I recently finished the Seven Habits and uh, Trace. That was thanks to your recommendation. I love that. You uh, learned about that on the show and decided to read it from the show. I did. Yeah. And in fact, it was the first Audible book that I did. I've always been a, you know, a paper guy. And you know what? I, I do drive so much. I should really take this time to turn my vehicle into a, a classroom. And it was a great experience. Um, the book was fantastic. And using Audible has been great. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, we have so much windshield time. And I, I got to be honest, in the beginning of my career, I wasted that. And I would, uh, I knew all the popular songs that were on the radio, but that really didn't help me with my career. And now with smartphones and all the apps that are available out there, there is no reason. And I love how you put it, that we can't turn our cars into a mobile classroom. Yeah, no, that's, that's absolutely right. So yeah, and obviously this podcast is a part of this. I, I listened to all the episodes and thanks for doing it. It's, it's a good resource. But yeah, back to the question. Uh, yeah, so Seven Habits was the one I think most recently finished. I'm re reading uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. That's uh, one of the great Western epics. Yeah, and then the other audiobook I just started was 12 Rules for Life. It's a, um, by Jordan Peterson. He's a clinical psychologist and kind of his take on the nature of humans and the best way to live and those kinds of things. Well, I'm going to ask you about Audible because I talk about Audible all the time. You had never used the service before and now you're using it. So how is it transitioning to using a service like Audible where somebody's reading to you? Did it take you a while to get into that? Do you have any tips for people that are just starting out? No, I mean, for me, it was pretty seamless. You know, obviously you just download the app and get the books online. The thing that I love about it is that you can speed the book up 
and depending on the narrator, you might be able to go faster than than others or the content, you know, how deep and uh, reflective you need to be about it. But I think, you know, a great piece of advice is if, if you're really wanting to, like maybe you're on a long road trip, drive in a couple hours to see a customer or something, you can just kind of be in the zone listening for a while is speed it up a little bit faster than what you're comfortable with, where it's just a little bit too fast, like maybe two and a half X. Listen to that for a minute or two and then back it down to like two X and you'll be able to listen to it faster than you might normally feel able to, but it won't feel so fast that it makes you feel anxious or that you can't understand. That's a great idea. I, I listen on higher speeds as well. And the piece of advice that I will give, and I don't know if you've experienced this, of course, I live in Georgia and people take a while to say what they're going to say. When you're used to that narrator at two times the regular speed, and then you get somebody that you're talking to that their regular speed is one half of normal speech, it's like you've had 400 cups of coffee and you just want to strangle them. So (laughs) be aware of what you're doing afterwards. I just know that from my own experiences. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's yeah, I think that's probably true. (laughs) So when Hollywood finds out about you and they make the movie, who plays you? Oh, man, you know, I'm I don't watch a lot of TVs or movie, so I'm just really bad with identifying actors and actresses. But, um, you know, a a show that I did watch that I really enjoyed was um, Sherlock Holmes with Benedict Cumberbatch. He's the guy that played Khan, right? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. All right. Well, I'm asking. But yeah, I knew that. I'm a Star Trek nerd. He played Khan. Oh, okay. Okay. (laughs) Yes, that tells you just how bad my pop culture knowledge is. But yeah, I just really enjoyed that show. All right. Well, well, that's a that's a good choice. So uh, you now have the ability to talk to anybody throughout history. Who would it be with and why? G.K. Chesterton. I don't know if you're familiar with, with him. I don't think I am. That doesn't uh, spring to mind. Okay. Yeah. So he lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I think he died in 1937, if I remember right. And so he was a contemporary of a lot of the great English writers and philosophers. Uh, He was really good friends with uh, George Bernard Shaw and he used to debate with Bertrand Russell and, you know, T.S. Eliot had mentioned that uh, all of Western literature owes a great deal to the the contributions that G.K. Chesterton made. He was really a polymath, you know, he, he was involved in a lot of different fields from philosophy, history, theology, literature, poetry, and just a prolific writer. I think in about 25 years he wrote over 100 books, over 200 short stories, and 4,000 essays. Wow. And he's just, uh, he was just a really sharp and bright thinker, very quick-witted, and just had a way to be able to explain complex or complicated things in a very clear and concise way. And uh, so I find that really inspiring. Well, I can tell you, without a doubt, nobody has ever chosen that. Yeah, <laughs> and, they, and they may not. It's a, it's a real shame he's not more well-known. Um, yeah, I guess one of the other things that he did is he's he's partially responsible for Charles Dickens becoming famous. He wrote a biography and that kind of forced him into popular culture. So, yeah. Well, Justin, I want to thank you for sharing your story with the Scaling Up Nation. Definitely a lot of tips, a lot of ideas, a lot of things that we should be thinking about as water treaters from this interview. So thanks so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure, Trace. Thanks for having me. Justin, thank you so much for coming on Scaling Up H2O. As I mentioned on the top of the show, we can learn so much just having the conversation about how each of us got into water treatment and what we do once we got there. Justin, you did not let us down. I know all of us have gotten a lot of information from your interview. And I have to say, the fact that we talked about safety, it's not the sexiest of topics, so it doesn't get a lot of press. I don't know if that's the right word or not, but we're not, we don't talk about safety a lot with each other. So I'm so glad you brought that up. You talked about fall prevention and then protecting ourselves. Folks, just think how simple it is to put on some gloves, some safety glasses, some earplugs, because we now can protect the things that allow us to do life, not just our job, and we can do it repeatedly. So something that I would like to ask you to do is before you go into a situation, 
process it before you proceed. So what I'm saying is scan the area. Don't just walk in and think you're going to start what you're doing. Just stop where you are, look around, and see if there are any potential issues that you need to mitigate your risk for. Then you can do that and you can safely perform the task and hopefully you can even eliminate a potential accident before you have to experience it. So just take a second, not a long time, but before you walk in and proceed with what you're going to do, just stop for a second, scan the area and see is there anything that you can do slightly different to help keep yourself a little bit safer. Remember to keep those questions coming. I'm specifically looking for Legionella questions, but I will take any question. Folks, you have the ability to make this show your own personal show. So what do you want to know out there? Send me a message, send me a voicemail, let me know what that is, and we will get that on the air. And if you do have some Legionella specific questions, let me know that too. And I am in the process of putting together a special Pinks and Blues episode to answer all of the questions that the Scaling Up Nation has on Legionella. Remember, next week we're going to be talking to two of the heads of the International Water Conference, so you won't want to miss that. I tried to ask them everything I thought you would want to know and everything I had a question about, so you're going to learn so much about the International Water Conference. In the meantime, I hope you have a great week, and I'll talk to you next week. If only I had a secret weapon to help me become more successful. When was the last time you thought that? Well, Nation, I might have the answer to that very thought. It is the Rising Tide Mastermind. The Rising Tide Mastermind is where like-minded individuals get together for the simple fact that we want each other to become more successful. We do that through reading books. We do that with asking each other questions. We do that with bringing issues to each other so we can each weigh in and give the person with the issue information that they may not have. Folks, this is a group of high performers. This is a group that will get you to the next level. If you want to find out more about the Rising Tide Mastermind, go to scalinguph2o.com to see if this group is right for you.